Hello, everybody. Welcome to our very first Elsevier Authors Hangout on Google+. My name is Steve Sazowski, and I'm the Social Media Marketing Manager for ElsevierAuthors.com. We're very excited to bring you our very first Google Hangout, where you can speak with your authors firsthand and ask them questions about your field of study. Our first Hangout today is a USMLE and Pharmacology chat with our very special guest. We're pleased to welcome Dr. Kelly Carpa, who is the author of Elsevier's Integrated Review Pharmacology. Dr. Carpa, welcome to your Hangout. Thank you, Steve. It's great to be here. Yeah, we're, we're very pleased to have you. Uh, so if you could just help us get started by introducing yourself and discussing your background in pharmacology. Sure. I was originally trained as a pharmacist and then a pharmacology researcher. For the last 13 years, I've been focusing on pharmacology education. I love using a variety of different pedagogies with students when we're in the classroom, TBL, simulation sessions, flipped classroom. Um, I've been recognized nationally and locally with a number of teaching awards. I've written books for pharmacists and articles for physicians and I, I just love education. Um, my primary area of interest from a research standpoint would probably be in the area of probiotics, those healthy bacteria and how they might be used therapeutically. I actually got into, my interest in that actually stemmed originally from a personal experience that I had with my son. Um, when he was two years old, he had Clostridium difficile diarrhea, and it wasn't resolving despite standard of care medical therapies, and it was probiotics that actually um, helped him get well again. Wow, that's excellent. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, so as I mentioned, we're very pleased to have you. So with that, let's get started. Are you ready? <laughs> I'm ready, Steve. All right. So over the past month, we've asked our social media fans and followers on Facebook and Twitter uh, to send in their questions about the USMLE and also specifically pharmacology. So Dr. Carpa, as the expert in this area, we welcome your thoughts and guidance on these questions. So let's get to the first question. Vihab, Vihab G asks, does the USMLE focus more on pharmacokinetic principles like absorption, distribution, etc., or clinical drug interactions? Well, that's a good question. I think you're probably more likely to see questions that ask you to apply information pertaining to absorption, distribution, metabolism, or elimination than you will be to just merely know that two drugs interact with one another. So you should be prepared to apply principles. For example, you should have a working knowledge of whether specific classes of drugs are eliminated renally. Say, for instance, aminoglycosides or ACE inhibitors. Or you should know what drugs tend to be eliminated hepatically, so the azole antifungals come to mind. Knowing that information can help you predict which drug should best be avoided in somebody with renal dysfunction or hepatic problems. Another pharmacokinetic principle that you should be familiar with has to do with drugs that are very potent P450 inducers or potent P450 inhibitors. Knowing this information will also allow you to predict the outcomes of what a drug interaction might be. Okay, great. Uh, so the next question is from Esther. Esther asks, I'm a first year med student and an upperclassman tell me pharmacology is one of the heaviest subjects for step one. What is the best way to study for step one pharmacology starting in the first year of med school? Another good question. I would say first start by putting every drug you encounter into a specific class, a class of drugs. There's probably thousands of individual medications and it's going to be impossible for you to keep thousands of drugs straight. So instead, consider drugs in terms of the class of agents that they're in. There's probably only 60 to 100 different classes. So it will just make things a lot simpler for you to keep track of. Secondly, make sure you learn the action of the drugs. What is the drug actually doing, specifically at the molecular level? Is the drug inhibiting a pathway? If so, what, what is being blocked biochemically? What, what comes after that blockade, as well as what is going to come before the blockade that, that's going to be stopped? This will also cause you to think about the side effects. Once you know how the drug works, you'll, you'll also have a good feeling for what problems might come from that action. And then, of course, thinking about elimination, how's the drug gotten rid of by the body, kidneys, or liver. Once you start having a good handle on these parameters, then you can worry about things like drug interactions. Um, we used to tell our students here at Penn State, you should know how a drug gets in, how a drug gets out, and what it does while it's there. 
And I think, actually, while that was a good good strategy for students, I heard recently a, another strategy that's used by Case Western students. They actually use the acronym CASE, C-A-S-E-D, where each letter stands for C for class, A for action, S for side effects, E for elimination, and D for drug interaction. So that's a good mnemonic to use when you're approaching each and every medication. Very cool. I wonder if that's a coincidence that it came from Case Western. I'm sure it's not. <laughs> All right, uh, very cool. Uh, so the next question is from Abhi. Abhi asks, what can I use for a very quick but thorough high yield review of all the farm I need to know to ace USMLE step two? Well, personally, I think the Elsevier's Integrated Pharmacology Review is a great source. Uh, it's an organ-based review book, and that's consistent with how many medical schools are actually teaching pharmacology in an organ-based fashion. The book also integrates very nicely with other disciplines, so there's biochemistry links, there's links back to physiology, there's links to clinical medicine. So in reviewing pharmacology, you're actually reviewing all of these other disciplines simultaneously. Um, I'm a very visually oriented person, so one of the things that I love about the textbook is how colorful everything is. Um, there's Since pharmacology is so based on mechanisms of action, there's plenty of colored figures showing the actions of drugs, there's boxes, there's tables, and unlike some textbooks where you can kind of read the text and ignore the figures and tables, this one is so jam-packed with high yield information, you really can't ignore anything. It's all relevant. And it also is very um, thorough in certain areas where medical students traditionally struggle, like cardiology, for example, or autonomics, or anti-infective drugs. These are areas that are definitely high yield for USMLE, and notoriously students have problems with these areas. And the text has received special kudos from both students and other educator faculty experts alike in these specific topic areas. Very cool. I actually have the book handy with me right here. Um, this is what the cover looks like. So it's Elsevier's Integrated Review Pharmacology. And we'll, I'll talk about this after our hangout so that everyone who's interested in the book can go on the web and learn more about it. Uh, so the next question is from Aaron S. And I apologize if I mispronounce some of these words. <laughs> now, how does trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole cause create, creatinine to increase? Creatinine, so, I think it's. So how does trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole cause creatinine to increase? That is a fabulous yes. question. Um, just because that's a mouthful, I'm going to refer to that drug combination as Bactrim because it's easier to say. So Bactrim, while it can cause acute interstitial nephritis, the most frequent cause for an increase in creatinine is actually an artifact. Um, Bactrim inhibits a cationic transporter that's also responsible for creatinine secretion. In so doing, serum creatinine is going to be elevated without an actual decrease in glomerular filtration rate. Another thing that's even more interesting, I think, because it is clinically relevant, has to do with the fact that this drug combination, specifically the trimethoprim, can actually cause hyperkalemia. And the reason for that is that trimethoprim inhibits a sodium channel on the luminal membrane. When you block that sodium channel, it decreases the driving force of the sodium-potassium ATPase on the basolateral membrane. As such, with less sodium being reabsorbed, there's less of a driving force for that sodium-potassium ATPase to exchange sodium for potassium. So potassium doesn't get lost in the urine and instead gets retained. So remember to be especially cautious clinically when using Bactrim in patients that have pre-existing renal dysfunction or folks that are also taking ACE inhibitors or they're using potassium-sparing diuretics. Many of you also remember that good hydration is also very important so that sulfamethoxazole doesn't precipitate out and cause kidney stones in these patients. So that was a fabulous question that actually um, brought out some other renal-related activities of that drug. Thank you. I think someone actually must have been calling you for another question. <laughs> they'll, have to, they'll have to join the next hangout. <laughs> That's right. Okay, so... Moving on to the next question, and I'm afraid to say that this is our, I'm sad to say that this is our last question for today. Ahmad M. writes, 
Why is tramadol classified as an opioid when it also seems to have SNRI activity? Well, that's another good question. So the tramadol has both weak opioid activity and it also inhibits the reuptake of serotonin and norepinephrine. So it's similar to some of our antidepressant drugs. Those latter effects of tramadol may actually help to modulate the emotional aspects of pain. Um, the drug has been studied as a treatment for pain and it also does have potential for abuse, um, especially for people in whom drug abuse has been a problem in the past. So probably those two factors together, the fact that it treats pain and that it has potential for abuse, is probably why it's usually considered as an opioid, a weak opioid, rather than as an antidepressant or an SNRI. Very nice. So we have some great questions, and thank you again for answering them. Uh, so as we wrap up, are there any key takeaways for students to remember when they study pharmacology? Sure, there's a few tips that I can think of, um, some of which we, we've already started to allude to a little bit, but I, I think focusing on class and action are, are the two big key points that students should remember. Um, re remember that when they're thinking about um, the, the actions of drugs, to also think about the underlying biochemistry or the underlying physiology of what, where the drug is in fact working. So studying pharmacology is actually a fabulous way to also review some of those other basic science disciplines. I think it's important that students not try to memorize random facts, because once they understand the actions of a drug, they'll actually automatically understand some of the other things that are happening in terms of side effects or understanding how the drug is eliminated. Um, some of those other things will just start to make sense once they understand the mechanism of action of the drug. So that would be my first tip. Uh, my second tip is that when students learn mechanisms, they shouldn't just memorize a, a random catchphrase. Um, for example, on the screen, uh, we have some antifungals. Students shouldn't just memorize, oh, this drug is an azole antifungal, but they also need to understand what the consequences of those, those actions are. So azole antifungals inhibit the enzyme 14-alpha demethylase. The students need to understand what's happening on both sides of that enzyme, that in so doing, that, that enzyme is responsible for ergosterol synthesis. And by not having that enzyme functional, is also causing the accumulation of squalene um, inside the cell or, or linosterol inside the cell. So students might not see a question based on, you know, what is the mechanism of fluconazole, but might actually be asked, what intracellular component does, does a drug such as fluconazole actually cause to increase? So, you know, linosterol would be the correct answer there. Another tip that comes to mind is that it's not enough to just associate a drug with a disease. Um, this is a, a, a problem that I see students making a lot of times. Um, and a great example of this has to do with a story that a nursing faculty member told me recently. Her, she was on the wards with one of her students, and she, the student was giving a proton pump inhibitor. So we know that proton pump inhibitors are used to treat and prevent and manage stomach ulcers. Well, the nurse asked her student, why are you giving this proton pump inhibitor to this patient in the ICU? And the student replied, because all patients in the ICU are put on PPIs to prevent ulcers. Well, the preceptor took that just a little bit further and, and questioned the student some more, and the student responded, because these patients in the ICU are prone to decubitus ulcers. The proton pump inhibitor protects the patient from bed sores. So, as you know pharmacology, and if you think proton pump inhibitors are used to prevent the type of ulcers that cause bed sores, you probably need to go back and review your pharmacology again, because in actuality, proton pump inhibitors are for stomach ulcers, not the cubitus ulcers. So a good example of why it's not okay just to memorize a drug and its disease, but actually understand the mechanism of action. I feel like, I'll give one more tip, and I feel like I'm starting to sound like a broken record, focusing on drug class and drug action. But again, when students encounter a drug name, they need to go back and figure out which class of drugs that, that drug fits into. And they also need to start looking at what some of the other drugs, drug names are that fit into that same class. Because, you know, in reality, in your classroom setting or your hospital environment, you might have only heard about uh, lisinopril because that's the drug that's on formulary at your hospital. But in reality, there's probably another seven or eight ACE inhibitors that you need to recognize because 
on USMLEs, you might not be tested on lisinopril. You might be tested on enalapril. But if you know the drugs and the class and how that class works, you'll be fine. Um, along those same lines, you'll also recognize then that a lot of drugs actually have this, that, that work by similar mechanisms, have the same suffix. So we've got our olals, we've got our prills and our sartans. Once students begin to recognize the pattern, that, that really takes a lot of the pressure off learning individual drug names. At the same time, there are some drug classes that just don't follow that, that nice suffix pattern. And so there's, there's, there's times when students are really just going to need to learn drug names and be able to recognize them. And the NSAIDs are a great example. Ibuprofen doesn't sound anything like Ketorolac, but they work by the same mechanism. And once students understand the mechanism of the class, they can answer questions about either drug, Steve. So again, class and action are the two biggest things when studying pharmacology. Well, thank you for those tips. They're very helpful. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate it. It's been my pleasure, Steve. Thanks for having me.